Episode 19 AD 1347-1396 In 1882, the French writer Ernest Renan delivered a speech to the Sorbonne entitled Qu'est-ce qu'une nation? What is a nation? Renan offered his audience a vision of the national community in what has become a classic formulation as a soul, a moral consciousness and awareness, a spiritual principle, a desire to live together and a will to perpetuate a heritage. Europe in the Middle Ages had such a soul and was moved by a shared moral awareness, a spiritual principle. Its people had such a desire to live as a community. They very definitely had the will to perpetuate a heritage, to foster and preserve their civilizational tradition. In 1882, Renan was speaking specifically of France, but the previous 18 episodes of this series have shown, I hope, that medieval Europe was, on Renan's criteria, just such an authentic nation, a community sharing a clearly delineated and uncontested common identity. Most non-academic history assumes the opposite. They are written as if all present-day nation-states have separate, mutually exclusive historical narratives of their national communities. Consciously or due to intellectual innocence, they retrofit history to fit the Procrustean bed of their particular nationalist beliefs. When you find the word national appearing in medieval history, it should act as a signal for alarm. And that word does begin to make its appearance as an underlying explanation in accounts of the 14th century as a kind of uninterrogated assumption stated as an irreducible fact. In my view, this is the historical error of anachronism, the putting of ideas that only arose later into the heads of people who lived earlier and is intellectually naive. So I think we should start by looking at the 14th century through the right end of the telescope, from the point of view of 14th century people, advancing into an unknown future but bearing the mentalité, the consciousness, they inherited from their already ancient historical heritage. What history has to explain is not the majesty of the great and fundamental fact of the consciously conceived community of medieval Christendom, but how it is that today we find imagined communities that are entirely conceived in terms of separate national states. The change from an ideologically undifferentiated but stateless Latin Christian society, from what effectively was a single European identity community, to a set of hardened national states, in fact came about via the formation of dynastic states or personal monarchies, not national states. This confused and violent process lasted for three or four hundred years, ending at about the turn of the 1700s. The national states, as we know them today, came about relatively recently, in a rapid and accelerating process following the Napoleonic Wars, and climaxing in the two monstrous nationalist wars of the early 20th century. The process of transformation from the Ur Europe, the original European national community, to a Europe of dynastic monarchical states begins tentatively and violently in the 1300s, and this is the subject of our present episode. Medieval people thought of themselves first and foremost as Christians. They thought globally in terms of the cosmos, from heaven and hell down through to their own lived lives in their villages and towns. But localism provided the concrete social experience, as it did the political reality, for most people, for many, many centuries. The countryside, where the vast majority of the population lived and worked, if we discount the ecclesiastical estates, was politically subordinated to the local seigneurial or warrior class. Each of these was obliged by bonds of fealty to a superior lord who could summon his military aid under specific circumstances and for a limited time. 
Otherwise, these mounted and armed territorial seigneurs were free and independent actors. They possessed liberty, to a degree that we, as citizens of mass democratic societies, can scarcely imagine. For them, personal freedom was a concrete reality, a lived experience, and they knew it. Their sense of freedom was subsumed into a morality of pride in their status, and a profound disregard for anyone not of their own kind, excepting the clergy. The culture of chivalry embodied this aristocratic pride, and gave it a code of behaviour and a set of higher ideals to live up to, a code and ideals which applied only among one's peers. Each lord was his own country, and its government. He operated his own foreign policy, forming alliances and scheming for advantageous marriages for his children, all aimed at furthering the family's power and thereby its possession of lands. The relationship between the community of seigneurial lords and their overlord, a great duke or a king, was based on a contract and an expectation that the overlord would lead them into conflicts which would bring rich rewards for each of them as being on the winning side. This was the essential glue that enabled a strong king to rule over and impose some degree of order on the heavily armed clientele who made up his kingdom. A weak king, or a regency, ruled by a queen, often forfeited the political and military support of the great nobility, and would see the kingdom disintegrate into a maelstrom of private wars waged between the vassals, with factions often forming to seize the throne itself. From the mid-1200s, these age-old political realities began to be challenged. European society was becoming more complicated and had built up a critical mass of institutions and interconnectedness that showed that it had fully recovered from the civilizational shock of having lost the Mediterranean as the heart and focus of the ancient world. Like a body that has had a vital limb amputated, society gradually healed itself and grew new limbs to substitute for the functions that had been lost. Ancient Mediterranean-based Roman society in this fashion transformed itself into medieval, continental-based European society. Cities had sprung up everywhere and had flourished. Networks of sea and land routes connected them in criss-crossing networks of commerce. The marauders who once sailed the Baltic and northern seas were tamed. Then these seas were cleansed of their nests of pirates by the incorporated merchants of the Hanseatic League, who operated a joint Thassalocracy from their port cities. The Hansa, as it was known, constituted a formal and chartered private state, with its own laws and courts, its organised policy-making assemblies, and its own naval and military forces. It worked in conjunction with the Plantagenet kings of England, with the bishops of Cologne, and with the Order of the Teutonic Knights in the Eastern Baltic, as it did with the Posadnik, or Mayor of Novgorod. Meanwhile, in the Mediterranean, as we have seen, the Great Republic of Venice had built a similar mercantile empire through its naval might and through its string of strongholds across the Eastern Mediterranean. Genoa rivaled it, with as much sea power and even more commercial daring. Barcelona, Naples and Marseille had their share in the Western Mediterranean trade. These two vigorous military commercial seaborne power networks of the Mediterranean and of the Baltic and North Sea were mirrored by two great regions of urban industrial and financial activity, that is, by northern Italy and by Flanders. In both regions the textile industry, from carding to weaving and dyeing, were pursued on a proto-industrial scale and degree of organisation. Plantagenet England grew rich on its huge flocks of sheep, shorn en masse for their fleeces each season, for export to the textile workshops of Bruges, Ghent and Ypres. Fortunes were made, small and some of them extremely large, by the more enterprising merchants, particularly those who engaged in the provision of financial services. 
the whole legal and practical methodology for a credit-based long-distance trading system spanning the whole European landmass was already developed by the early 1300s. What we term capitalism had come into being. The merchants and other greater businessmen formed the class of the burghers of these cities. The name derives from the late Roman and Carolingian term burgos, meaning a fortified settlement, a place with a wall. The city of Burgos in Spain, whose stout walls were built in 884 AD, bears this very name. The merchant elite formed the core of the citizens and, as the rich and literate section of the community, provided its leadership and dominated its public life. They were the city fathers, the boni homines, the good men. The French term is bourgeoisie, those of the bourg, a term so corrupted from its original meaning by 20th century Marxism. The bourgeois were a new factor in medieval society's constitution. By 13 they had become a formidable power in their own right. An example of the power of the city bourgeoisie can be seen in the kingdom of Castile. In 1282 the Infante, the heir apparent, Don Sancho, rose up in revolt against his aged father, King Alfonso X, El Sabio. The conflict within the royal family was symptomatic of the nature of medieval kingship. The frontier with the Muslim world in the Sierra Nevada had stabilized. There were no more territorial gains to be made, and the king had no new lands to grant his great nobles. At the same time, these lords were seeing their existing revenues shrink due to population decline poor harvests, and higher monetary prices. The result was chaos. Local lords at all levels took advantage of the political disintegration to use violence to extend their personal holdings. They attacked and besieged their neighbours, and when he could not be assailed in his castle, they devastated his crops and destroyed his peasants' villages, the normal means of warfare. A political movement to confront this situation arose in the northern cities of Galicia and León, and rapidly spread down the peninsula. Its immediate aim was to assert and protect the fuerros, or libertades, won during the long period of reconquest of the peninsula from the Moors. This movement became known by the name of Las Hermandades, the Brotherhoods. Cloaked under the pious declared aim of protecting the royal family, its prerogatives and its patrimonial states, from the nobility's avarice, the hermandades had other agendas, which were to protect themselves from the processes of royal centralization, from the jurisdictional interference of the crown, from the subordination of customary laws to a new unified regnal law, and in a, quote, refusal to submit to a fiscality which was not regulated by local legislative bodies. Unquote. This was an early medieval form of the principle of no taxation without local representation. In their charters of federation, the consejos or councils of the cities swore mutual military aid to one another, organized to restrain and punish the feuds and arbitrary violence of the nobility all in the name of the public order. The bourgeois espoused the revived concept from Roman law of the status regni, or utilitatis regni, the condition of the kingdom or the utility of the kingdom, what was later to be called in English the common weal or commonwealth. The traditional concept that all right and all property was both personal and private, in absolute disregard of any other claims, and to the detriment of the surrounding society, was being challenged by the idea of the public good and of the public order. The Hermandades formed a vast and organized military federation of cities, perhaps modeled on the Lega Lombarda of northern Italy, which had brought low the Holy Roman Emperor Frederickus II in the same century. In 1298, at the Cortes de Quellar, the Hermandad took the further step of affirming its right to appoint a committee of twelve of their number, 
which was to be the royal council and act as the guide and chief decision-maker of the regency's policy. This is the medieval prototype for a constitutional monarchy, the executive power of the crown being under the tutelage of the assembly of the burghers. Historians have described the later Cortés de Carrión, held in 1317 as a revolutionary, as it compelled the Castilian monarchy formally to recognize the Hermandad as a pillar of the constitution. It had its own legislative program point by point agreed to by the crown. The city's customary rights and legal immunities were reaffirmed and the royal magistracies in the cities were elected and occupied by the bourgeois themselves. All this came to a crashing end in 1325, when King Alfonso XI took power. He re-established public order through a combination of summary executions of nobles and through promises made to them, and by relaunching an expansionary crusade against the Emirate of Granada, this brought bringing booty and territory to his nobles. He dissolved the hermandades and replaced the elected bourgeois magistrates with his own rigadores, choosing non-noble letrados, university-educated legal professionals, for these offices. Alfonso XI was, in these terms, the very figure of what a king should be, and it was perhaps lucky for Spain and for Europe that he was. For in 1333, Mohammed IV, Sultan of Granada, appealed to the great leader of the Beni Merids in Morocco, Abu Hassan, to make war on the Christians in Al-Andalus. Hassan dispatched an initial force that landed at Algeciras, and together with the forces of Granada, took the citadel of Gibraltar. By the way, in those days, what we call Granada was called in Arabic Harnata. Determined to reverse all the Christian gains made over the previous century, Abu Hassan assembled a very substantial army to cross the Straits and invade Castile. In 1340, he led his fleet of 100 galleys and 67,000 men from Cuenta across to Algeciras, the chief Muslim port on the Iberian Peninsula. He destroyed the much smaller Castilian fleet, with only five of its galleys managing to escape intact to the port of Cartagena. He then, with the Grenadans, laid siege to Tarifa as the first step in the invasion of New Castile. Even today, some towns in this region are named La Frontera, from the time when the frontier really was along this line. Tarifa held out, giving Alfonso the time to gather the Castilian nobility and the forces of the cities. He appealed to and received large contingents from the kingdoms of Aragon and Portugal, as well as Genoese galleys to fill out a quickly reconstructed naval force, with which he cut off the supply lines of the Muslims across the straits from Morocco. The decisive clash occurred between the hills and the sea some kilometres from Tarifa, the main feature of the field was a stream called the Salado, which provided an obstacle to the only 21,000 strong Christian force. In a long and ferocious battle of charges by the knights and amid the chaos, counterattacks by the Moors, the tide finally turned decisively in favor of the Europeans. Their victory was crushing and total. The Marinids fled back to Algeciras, coming from the word Algezira, the island, and back across the straits. So much booty was brought back to Seville that in Paris the going price for gold and silver fell. There was nothing inevitable about this victory. We make the mistake of assuming that things had to turn out the way they did. This is a natural way of thinking, but also essentially a superstitious one. The clash at Salado was between a Christian force that was a third the size of the Muslim one. The outcome was the result of accident, of courage, and of many, many small incidents of desperation. Thereafter, Alfonso sent out the call to crusade to take Algeciras itself. The siege lasted from 1342 to 1344, 
giving time for the great lords of Christendom to come to participate. We know that among them were the King of Navarre, Gaston de Béarn, and the greatest and richest lord of England, Henri de Grossmont, Duc de Lancastre. Yes, in later English, Henry, Duke of Lancaster. Henri was representative of his time, with vast estates throughout England and holding several titles. With his revenues, sufficient to support a principality, he was enabled to build in London a palace of regal proportions. He led his own contingent, in effect a small army, in feudal service to his Plantagenet king, Edward III, in Scotland, in France, and in Flanders. An epitome of the chivalric ideal, he did not remain idle between his liege lord's wars, but sailed off to bring support to the knight's hospitallers in their raiding along the Turkish coast. We see him here at the siege of Algeciris in 1344. On another expedition, he crossed northern Europe to participate in the annual crusade of the Teutonic Knights into the great and powerful pagan principality of Lithuania. The northeastern frontiers of Latin Christendom were different. On this side, Christendom faced not Islamic civilization, but classic paganism. Their gods were headed by the thunder-gatherer Perkunas, common to the whole Baltic region, to whom animal sacrifices were made for favors for relief from hardship. In times of dire emergency, human sacrifice was not excluded. The Lithuanian chieftains led a formidable war machine, well capable of defeating the mounted, plate-armored charge of the knights. They had extended their rule to the south into the Ukraine and west into Poland. By the mid-1300s, their Christian subjects, both Latin and Orthodox, by far outnumbered the original tribal Lithuanians themselves. For about a century, the Lithuanian chieftains flirted with both the emissaries from Rus and Constantinople, as they did with those from Avignon and the Latin bishoprics of Riga and Krakow. But it was clear to them, well informed of the shape of the world, that orthodoxy was centered on the feeble Roman Empire and represented by Russian principalities existing in the shadow of the Mongol Golden Horde. From Vilnius, Europe looked far more attractive and more formidable. The Order of the Hospital of Our Lady at Jerusalem, the Teutonic Knights, had the century before absorbed the local orders of the Schwertbrüdern and the Knights of Dobrin. They had gradually conquered East Prussia. King Ottokar II of Bohemia had joined them in 1254 for the crusading season. In gratitude, they named their new German city of Königsberg, King's Mountain, in his honor. In 1246, the order bought Estonia from the King of Denmark. They were firmly implanted in the Kurland, modern Latvia. They operated a polity which we today find hard to conceive, called an Ordenstaat in modern German, an iron and highly efficient hegemony run with the hierarchy and discipline of a monastic order, but from fortresses instead of monasteries. From the Lithuanian's perspective, the knights constituted the most fearsome and relentless war machine of the entire region. Subjugation to their rule would mean the extinction of the Lithuanian elite. In 1384, a diplomatic opportunity presented itself. The throne of the Polish kingdom was inherited by the ten-year-old Princess Jadwiga. The Lithuanian chieftain, termed a Grand Duke by the Latins, Jogaila, offered a marriage. He was baptized at Krakow on the 15th of February, 1386, and married Jadwiga three days later. The Lithuanian aristocracy converted with him, and Lithuania became, over the following centuries, a part of Latin Christian civilization, in fact the last country of Europe. This union between the loose kingdom of Poland and the Christianizing Lithuania led to the fusion of their aristocracies and the emergence of 
the territorially huge entity of Poland-Lithuania, with Polish as the language of the elite, which was to exist as a single country until 1795. We have seen that Henri de Lancastre, the Duke of Lancaster, had shown up then to fight for the cause of Christendom on three of its contested frontiers. In Spain there was a victory, repulsing what was to be the final attempt by Islam to regain the Iberian Peninsula. In Lithuania, a great principality voluntarily merged with Latin Christian Poland and began its apprenticeship to the European form of life. But in the southeast, on the geographical marker between Europe and Asia, the Bosphorus and Dardanelles, the struggle was going the other way. We have seen how the western coastal cities of Greco-Roman Asia Minor were swallowed up by the rising power of the Osmanli Turks. And we might remember that it was the Turks, after the Battle of Manzikert in 1071, who had caused such alarm in Europe as they swept through Asia Minor and took the Holy Land, that they triggered the Christian response of the Crusades. Now they were perched just a couple of kilometers across the Straits of the Dardanelles, and owing to the phenomenon of the Ghazi warriors, teeming with an excess of military capacities. The Osmanli Bey was now Orhan, son of Osman. He was courted by one or other side of the contestants among the great Greco-Roman families for the hire of his Ghazi warriors and Sipahi cavalry as mercenaries in their perennial civil wars. And he was happy to play this profitable role. The emperor at Constantinople married his own daughter to Orhan to cement their alliance. Large Turkish mercenary bands fought under their own leaders, such as Suleiman, Orhan's own son. These forces fought in northern Thrace, at Adrianopolis, and at Thessalonica. They fought other Romans, and they fought against Serbs and Bulgars. They saw much and learned much. Aggressive leaders like Suleiman learned disdain for the way of life of the Romans and contempt for their military prowess. The feuding Romans, the Catechusene and Paleologoi, continued rubbing shoulders with the very people who would be their own nemesis. Even the Venetians honoured Orhan with the noble title in return for his military aid against the Genoese. The question was, would the Turks quietly return across the Dardanelles once they had been paid and their services were no longer needed? During the campaigns of 1352, Suleiman's troops occupied a number of places in the Thracian Cherosonese, including the fortress of Tsumpe near Gallipoli. The name in Greek was Kalipolis, beautiful city. We use the Italian pronunciation Gallipoli. When the fighting was over, they refused to leave and would not even accept a handsome bribe. Negotiations were still in progress when an event occurred which transformed the situation. On the night of March 2nd, 1354, the whole coastline of Thrace was devastated by an earthquake. Some places simply disappeared. The Greek populace of many of the towns fled in panic. Suleiman was at Pegai in Bithynia when the news arrived. He immediately crossed by night over to Thrace, bringing with him a great crowd of Osmanlis with their wives and children to take possession of the deserted towns and villages. They energetically repaired the damaged walls and restored the fortifications in many places. Special attention was given to Gallipoli. Soon the town was securely fortified and had a large Turkish garrison manning the walls. The city was repopulated by Turkish settlers of all classes from across the water. Suleiman died from a fall from his horse. Orhan's second son, Murad, became leader in 1361. Murad adopted the style of Sultan, or monarch. His ambition was to extend Osmanli dominion over Thrace and the whole region of the Balkans, which had once been the Eastern Roman Empire. But first he had to deal with the other Turkish Beylik of Karaman, which he finally crushed at the Battle of Konya and annexed. His European ambitions led him easily to take the Roman city of Adrianopolis 
in 1365. This city, named after Emperor Hadrian and the site of the great defeat of the Romans by the Goths in 378 AD, became the new Osmanli capital. They renamed it Edrine, as it is still known. They called their new European province Rumeli, literally Roman land, land of the Romans. In 1385, Murad took Sophia, meaning wisdom in Greek. The Christians of the Balkans were appropriately alarmed enough to bury their differences and confront him. The clash came on June 15, 1388, five kilometers north of Pristina at Kosovo Polje, an event and location that has sacred status in present-day Serbian nationalism. Both armies nearly destroyed one another, and Murad himself was assassinated by a Serbian warrior after it had ended. The bloodletting wiped out most of the Serbian military class, while the Turkish forces were soon replenished with reinforcements from their now vast hinterland. In the subsequent years, the whole of the Balkans fell to Turkish power. Murad was succeeded by Bayezid I. Before his accession, the main characteristics of Turkish power were already laid down. Any internal competition for the Sultanate within the royal family resulted in the summary slaughter of the relatives, no matter how close. The system of the divan, from which we derive our word for an oriental couch, was made the form of government. This was the inner cabinet of the Sultan, presided over by the Grand Vizier in his absence, and made up of the other viziers in charge of the various departments of the administration and the army. All of these officers were by status the personal slaves of the Sultan, subject for their very lives to his arbitrary will and whim. They themselves nevertheless wielded absolute power over the society beneath them. The army had a revolutionary new element, the Yenicheri, new soldiers, known to us as the Janissaries. In keeping with an Islamic tradition going back to the conquest by Caliph Omar of Sassanid Persia in the 640s AD, these were also slave soldiers, systematically and forcibly abducted as boys from their Christian parents. This was called the Devshirme system. This cruel, state-organized, forced abduction of young boys is dressed up nowadays as being somehow the an equivalent of the European feudal system of raising mercenaries. That it was a great boon and privilege for the boys themselves, which gladdened the hearts of their parents when they were chosen. I leave you to come to your own conclusions. The crop of boys was taken to Adrianople and converted to Islam, and assigned to a life lived in a barracks. They were given a distinguishing form of dress to show they were the Sultan's elite slaves, and were drilled continuously in military exercises. They were the most effective and most feared military formation in Europe and the Middle East for centuries. The Sultan used them politically to overawe his own Turkish lords and secure his absolute power. This system presented Europe with its first experience of a professional standing army since the days of the Roman legions. For anyone with eyes to see, the once unimaginable must have been becoming clear. Constantinople was doomed. With the establishment of the Turks at Adrianople, as such a well-adapted machine of conquest, a political, military culture, whose origins lay in Central Asia and which embodied every aspect of Islamic civilization, had crossed onto the European landmass and set up its capital there. And what was the response of Christendom? There was to be no response, not for several decades. In previous episodes, we have seen how the century from 850 to 950 AD had been a terrible and destructive low point in European historical experience. The 1300s, as the decades advanced, proved to be as bad, indeed in many aspects far worse. For the political structure and the social order of the heartlands of Europe were collapsing in upon themselves. <laughs>
despite and in large measure because of the greater sophistication of European society, the strains of adaptation accumulated to the point of breaking the bonds that held society together. The imaginative apparatus available to people at the time naturally turned their minds to an apocalyptic explanation of their calamitous experiences. The end of days was upon them, as St. John the Evangelist had written in about 90 AD. Christ in majesty had opened four of the seven seals on the scroll of destiny that he held in his right hand and had unleashed the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they being conquest, war, famine and death. Conquest there was, as we have just seen. The Roman Empire of Constantinople was surrounded and beleaguered. There was famine. From the beginning of the century, the climate of Europe underwent an alteration. Average temperatures dropped. Long periods of rain and a deep frozen winter became the norm. This was what has been called the Little Ice Age. It forced the abandonment by Scandinavians of their settlements on the southern tip of Greenland, a way station for the rare adventurers sailing on to the coast of Labrador in North America. The Norse settlement of Greenland had lasted from the 980s AD to about 1350. In Europe proper, the long centuries of high agricultural productivity were ending. Crops were more frequently ruined, yields diminished per hectare. Famine, which had never been absent, now became a large-scale and recurrent phenomenon from region to region. The horsemen of death came too, but in a form that was truly shocking. A population decimating plague had occurred between the 450s and 700 AD, called the Plague of Justinian, but this was unknown to any but a few scholars. The pestilence is said to have arisen in the Far East, perhaps in that great incubator of dangerous mutations of microorganisms, southern China. It was almost always quickly lethal and was tremendously contagious. As it cut swathes through the local populations, it spread westwards by virtue of the extended trade networks made possible by the Mongol dominion, along the Silk Route to the steppes of Ukraine, to Sarai, and from there it arrived in the Crimea. In what has been called by a respected French historian as the first known instance of biological warfare, the Crim Tartars then besieging the Genoese port city of Kaffa catapulted plague-infested corpses over the walls. The modality for the plague to enter Europe was provided by its extensive sea-trading networks, a feature of Europe's development. In October 1349, a Genoese ship returning from Caffa put in at Messina in Sicily. With it came the deadly multiplying bacillus. In October of this year, in a paper published in PLOS Pathogens, a team of European scientists has confirmed the identity of the Black Death bacillus as Yersinia pestis and has isolated its genotype. Many general accounts of the Black Death are available. Barbara Tuchman's chapter in her excellent 1978 narrative of the 14th century gives details that I have no time to repeat here. Most people know that in two years it wiped out a third of the population of Europe, that it recurred again in the 1360s, and that by the end of the century the cumulative death toll may have been half the population of the continent. I just want to remark on a few features of how the Black Death has been absorbed into popular consciousness today. The Black Death is imaginatively conflated together with the as they say, fanatical crusades and the superstitious, priest-ridden credulity of the people of the Middle Ages. Modern representations of the Black Death inevitably have the figure of the spookily cowled monk feature prominently. Life in the medieval world was awful, and it was awful because people were so stupid, ignorant and dirty, believing everything the priests told them. In a perverse and cruel criticism of the Middle Ages as not us, the Black Death is somehow blamed on the people of the time for their ignorance and credulity. 
This is part of a conscious polemic to denigrate the Middle Ages that has been elaborated by the Reformation and then by the Enlightenment. As in all gross distortions, there is a germ of misused truth in the image. The cowled monk mentioned before is a stock hate figure. He is based on the phenomenon of the flagellanti, the flagellants. Such was the shock and horror caused as everyone near and dear to one lay dying that quite understandably social panic took hold in many communities. Groups of processional penitents began to appear in the second year of the plague. They walked in large groups from town to town, chanting prayers and whipping themselves on their bare backs. This practice can still be seen today in all its gruesomeness in Shia Muslim religious life. The medieval idea was that by their suffering they propitiated the wrath of the deity and distracted it away from the wider community. And thousands of people were awestruck and chastened by the spectacle. But these were not monks, nor were they priests of any kind. They were illiterate lay enthusiasts, often without firm social roots of their own, who suddenly found themselves the center of attention and in a position of power. They were led by masters, as they call them, who acted as captains, commanding their followers, organizing their spectacles, speaking on their behalf to the people, and taking over religious and political authority in the city or village. They took over the churches, kicked out and threatened the clergy, ridiculed the Eucharist, and claimed supernatural powers for themselves to cast out demons and heal the sick. A particular feature of the flagellant masters was their demonization of the Jewish communities of the towns, who were blamed for poisoning the wells and were isolated as the cause of the pestilence. On arrival in a town, the flagellants would line up in the market square and rhythmically whip themselves for some time, whereupon their masters would speak to the crowd and stir up their panic and anger. The flagellants demanded not merely the expulsion of the Jews, but their immediate extermination and this indeed happened on a widespread pattern. The flagellants were an anti-clerical, anti-establishment, millennial outburst among ordinary people. Their revolutionary actions, their megalomania and their destructiveness prefigure those of the Anabaptists of two centuries later. In 1349, Pope Clement VI at Avignon issued a bulla of excommunication to suppress the movement, which was violently opposed to the existing religious order. The Pope pointed out that Jews were also dying of the plague and were therefore not its cause. The regional authorities took the Pope's signal and set about taking action against the movement. Flagellism was outlawed. Those apprehended were summarily hung. This anarchic and violent popular movement evaporated as quickly as it had formed. So people then were acquainted with conquest, famine, and with death, the latter on a colossal scale. The last of the four horsemen of the apocalypse was war. There always had been war. It was endemic to the political structure of society and chronic in its occurrence. But the escalating competition between what were now very powerful princes unleashed war on a scale and of a destructiveness that had not been seen in Christendom for many centuries. Again, the underlying causes of this outbreak were to be found in the very progress of society itself. What I have referred to previously as the inescapable conflicts among the elites, so brilliantly characterized by Norbert Elias, and its inherently escalating mechanism of ever larger confrontations brought the core of Europe to its knees in the later 1300s. The aristocracy were richer, had stronger castles, larger retinues, and plate armor of great expense. The culture of chivalry had crystallized into an elaborate literature, a set of social rituals, such as jousting, dancing, feasting, and hunting, and had become a kind of moral obsession for the secular ruling class. <laughs> 
The inner tensions of the Christian Republic came to a head in the 1340s, when the Plantagenet King of England, as Duke of Aquitaine, lost his patience after decades of insult and hostility by the kings of Paris, his overlord. In a quite normal feudal political move, when the last of the line of the Capetians died in 1328, the dowager Queen of England, Isabelle de France, daughter of Philippe le Bel, staked a claim to the French crown for her son, Édouard Plantagenet. The other contender was Philippe de Valois. Both Édouard and Philippe had good title in the terms of the time. But it was Philippe whom the assembled magnates, the Père de France, confirmed as King Philippe VI. Isabel sent two bishops to Paris to press her claim, but they were not received. From her perspective, it was nonsense to say that her son was a foreigner. He was the grandson of Philippe le Bel, spoke French as his native tongue. She wouldn't even have thought this worthy of mention, so obvious was it, and the son of a French-born queen. There was nothing odd or improbable about the future king of England claiming to be the legitimate king of France. In June 1329, Édouard came with an immense retinue to the cathedral of Amiens, where he placed his hands between those of his overlord, for Aquitaine, Philippe VI. Philippe, however, insisted that certain lands in Aquitaine remained forfeit. This led to an immediate dispute, and then an explosion of anger. Warfare quickly followed. Everyone observing expected the Plantagenets, as the lesser feudal formation, to lose in this conflict. They were surprised when the first set-piece battle at Crécy in 1346 resulted in a complete victory for the Plantagenets. A truce was humiliatingly agreed to, and negotiations dragged on. But by 1356, war was again declared. The Prince of Wales, the so-called Black Prince, landed a large force at Plantagenet Bordeaux and proceeded to lay waste large areas of western France. This was the practice of the chevauché, the riding forth, which entailed the normal business of warfare at the time, the burning of villages, the slaughter of anyone who got in the way, the targeted destruction of bridges, mills, wine presses, of vines in the fields, the burning of barns and the torching of crops, as well as the looting and carrying off of everything of value. Towns were burned to the ground, but without a massacre. And this was done with a good conscience. A letter from the Black Prince in the war zone to the Bishop of Winchester, written of course in French, begins with the phrase, Reverend Pierre en Dieu est très foyable ami. Reverend Father in God and Most Faithful Friend. The letter is a mere list of brave exploits, recounting how he had taken this or that fortress and that town, and how he had bettered his adversaries. The King of France by this date was Jean, who summoned all the nobility of France owing him allegiance, and issuing the arrière bain or general call-up, for every man between the age of 16 and 60 to either bear arms or pay for a mercenary to substitute for groups of them. The clash occurred just outside the city of Poitiers on the 19th of September 1356. It was a complete debacle for the much larger French host. Many thousands were killed and many great nobles captured, including, and this was spectacular news at the time, King Jean himself who had not deserted the field and fought on to the last with his young son beside him. Jean was taken prisoner to Bordeaux and later to London, with all the other lords that had been captured. The demands made by Édouard Plantagenet for a peace settlement were enormously grievous from the French side's perspective. A ransom of four million gold écus and half the territory of the Kingdom of France, in effect. In May 1360, the Treaty of Bretigny was signed, hostages were exchanged, and the ransom began to be collected. But the war had already devastated large areas of France, just a few years after the Black Death had swept through it. Now taxation of all kinds was being levied to raise the king's ransom. In 
But there was another factor, a true apocalyptic scourge had emerged. These were the companies, large and small bands of mercenaries, bloodied and brutalized in a war of pillage and slaughter, and suddenly discharged en masse with small pay. These were to be the new plague of the age. The plague itself returned in 1360. But the companies remained a major factor in European life for the next century. The companies were the outcome of the changes that had occurred in military tactics. Very large numbers of very rough types were recruited, but there was little concept of what to do with them when they were no longer needed. They were simply let loose, still in a country that was not their home. They had learned their trade in war, and it was plunder, it was rape and wanton murder. They stayed together, and some bankrupt nobles and defrocked priests joined them and gave them leadership. They wandered throughout the countryside, laying waste all they passed through like a swarm of locusts. They were perceived by the peasantry of France and beyond as a kind of natural phenomenon, an inhuman scourge that had no reason for existing. The devastation was on a gigantic scale. With time, they settled into a parasitic symbiosis with the society they preyed on. Formal and written so-called treaties of extortion and protection money were made with defenseless towns. Tribute was extracted just by being in the district, again in return for not devastating it. They were hired by princes as they were needed. Some of their captains were given lands and honours. They were known as the Ecochères, the flares or skinners. The whole society was prey to mass armed gangs. This is what happens when public order breaks down. It is the natural, anarchic condition of society when there is no legitimate, superior, coercive force to prevent this happening. Even though the Ecochères were perceived by local people in France to be the English army, still the scourge spread back to the island of England itself when many mercenaries and lesser knights returned home. They applied in England what they had learned in France. Quite often the line between being a local lord and being merely a mounted brigand disappeared. The scourge developed within the Holy Roman Empire also, from less direct causes. The western lender of Germany, from the foot of the Alps down the Rhineland, saw the practices of the Räuberbaronen, the original robber barons. Mere anarchy was loosed upon the world, and it became permanent. The peace of Bretigny collapsed in 1369, and war resumed between the Plantagenet and Valois. It ground on undecisively until 1389, when the main figures had died of old age or illness. The new kings of France and England were respectively Charles VI and Richard II, who signed the truce of Lullingham and agreed to eternal amity in the name of a united Christendom and in the cause of the Crusade. Here is an extract from a letter of May 1395 from Charles VI to Richard II. Beloved brother, we devoutly pray to God that through his grace he will cause us to meet together in person, not in royal pomp, but in all humility, in the love of God, trusting that he will show us grace and restrain his chastising rod, which has long belabored Christendom through the faults of our predecessors. Then, fair brother, it will be a fit moment and one pleasing to God that you and I, for the propitiation of the sins of our ancestors should undertake a crusade to succor our fellow Christians and to liberate the Holy Land, first won for us by the precious blood of the Lamb who was slain for his flock. And so, through the power of the cross, we shall spread the Holy Catholic faith throughout all parts of the East, demonstrating the gallantry of the chivalry of England and France and of our other Christian brothers." End quote. This says something of the mentality and spirit of the times. This reconciliation, which, though utterly sincere, and was to be but temporary, 
did provide the conditions for a great crusade aimed at repulsing the Turks from Europe, which was undertaken in 1395. Led by Jean, Duc de Bourgogne, Duke of Burgundy, and with contingents from many of the greatest nobles of France, from England, from the Rhineland, Bavaria and Flanders, they came to the aid of the King of Hungary, who now found himself standing on the new frontier between Christendom and Islam, on the borders of his own kingdom in Central Europe. A fleet of ships of the Venetians, Genoese and the Knights Hospitaller of Rhodes sailed up the Danube to support them. The Turkish Sultan Bayezid I was at that time besieging Constantinople itself. The crusading army arrived on the lower Danube in September 1396, and Bayezid, breaking off his siege, confronted the Christians at Nicopolis. Nicopolis means city of victory, and had been founded by Emperor Octavian to celebrate his victory over Antony and Cleopatra at Actium. The battle started bravely, with the Burgundian knights fighting on foot, killing large numbers of the enemy, but their tactics, if heroic, were precipitate. Exhausted from slashing their way in full steel armour up a hill, they arrived at the top to find the fresh main body of the Turkish army coming at them, led by the Janissary Corps d'Elite. The Christian force was utterly destroyed. Jean, having fought in the van on foot, managed to escape back to the Danube and take ship, earning the name that has stuck to him through history as Jean Saint-Père, John the Fearless, an odd subrequit, given the circumstances. The crusade had been a complete disaster. The entire position of the Latins in the eastern Mediterranean and in Hungary was now under threat. The Roman Empire at Constantinople was in its death throes. Europe began to understand that a new superpower had announced itself in the southeastern borderlands of Latin Christendom. Europe was now and would remain internally disabled by its own civil wars. Christendom lay open before the new Islamic superstate of the Ottoman Turks.